So you might remember from earlier on lightning talks, so when you take a really long talk and you cram it down to three minutes and have a whole lot of fun with it. And to take you through that um, this afternoon is Chris. Hi. Uh, Martin Craft. Okay, uh, there'll be a brief pause while we get set up. Uh, this will be probably our least uh, smooth transition throughout the, uh, the entirety of the afternoon. Uh, but while Martin is setting up, uh, are you plugging in at all? Oh. I, I, I was going to explain what was going on while Martin plugged his laptop in and he decided he didn't need to do that, which has left me um, slightly, uh, slightly uncomfortable up here. Anyway, um, so uh, lightning talks are our traditional close here at LCA. This year they are three minute talks uh, on a whole wide variety of, uh, of subjects. Um, for the people who are presenting, there's a clock here that Adam uh, in the front row is running. That will be counting you down to three minutes. Uh, when we start getting towards the last 10 or so seconds, we need you to get ready to applaud people off. And the easiest way to do this is to make a really loud noise with your two, two four fingers. So you make a really quite loud sound until it's time to applaud, at which point you applaud <laughs> until I tell you to stop because we don't have any spare time. Um, so this year we had, I think, 36 submissions for lightning talks. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to present even half of those. Uh, but the less than half that we have selected, uh, myself and Hugh Blemings, my uh, uh, co-lightning talks are, I guess, this year. Is that how it works? Um, and yeah, so uh, it's time for some lightning talks. Uh, on deck we have uh, Bryn Lee, so if you can come and get set up. But first, Martin Craft. Hi there. So trust, digital trust and trust in the real world are actually not that much different. Both are really hard. But there's a difference because trust in the real world is something that's intuitive to us. It's natural. It's even natural to the point of nature, as in it's wired into our brains and bodies to the point that it informs our survival mechanism. Now compare that to the laptop I gave to my aunt for Christmas with Ubuntu installed. It's also got Firefox and therefore I seeded her trust in this digital world with a set of CAs that I downloaded on my Debian computer and so therefore I trusted Debian because at some point in time somebody handed me a floppy disk and I don't even know anymore who that was. At this point in time I want to say my aunt is very tech savvy. She set up the printer all by herself on Linux, the printer. <laughs> but then again, she doesn't actually know why that lock is there in the URL bar. I mean, she knows that it's good when it's there, but she doesn't actually know why she trusts this website. And of course, sometimes she chooses to continue anyway, even if the lock isn't there or it's a skull, because she needs to get something done. How can we improve the situation? Well, just imagine the following. Imagine that the expression of trust towards the internet in the digital world wasn't a set of choices you once made and then forgot about, but rather a, the result of a computation that happens in real time. A computation that takes into account your interactions with other people, because trust is inherently human. It takes into account the mood of these interactions. Hey, and we know the web of trust didn't work really well and it certainly can't express mood, but doesn't that sound like an excellent application for machine learning? <laughs> Locally, of course. And in a way that makes these trust expressions trackable and revertible because you might want to be able to change things when you change the way you think about certain people. And then imagine you're grounded in that experience. When my aunt visits a website, maybe there's a photo of myself floating in the background through her AR so that she feels safe. Maybe when she's in a shady place, the browser emits a stink. <laughs> because trust is hard, and maybe the future can bring us a solution. Even if, for instance, blockchain is a trustless solution, it's useless without a trusted channel through which we can exchange addresses. 
So I'm looking forward into a future where we can leverage machine learning and AR and hopefully not have browsers, browsers that fart. Thank you very much. Minecraft. Okay. Uh, up on deck is uh, Matt Sherborne, I think his name is. I lost the card over there, sorry. Um, but first, uh, Brinley Colin Stone. Kia ora koutou. Is that we good? Um, I'm a speech and language therapist, and I work in alternative and augmentative communication. So I work with people, perhaps like Lost Voice Guy, you might have seen, or Stephen Hawking, who use communication technology because they're unable to communicate with their voices. Um, this is Geneva, all the way up here. Um, she uses a combination of spelling and symbols on a system called MinSpeak, which is one of these alternative and augmentative communication systems. And she's able to communicate anything that she wants to, and she's achieved a Bachelor of Communications using her technology. However, both Geneva and I have identified a gap, which we both believe is a justice issue, in AAC provision in New Zealand. That is, that we're not able to use these devices to speak te reo Māori, which is our indigenous language, and actually, which should be a right according to the Treaty of Waitangi. So, I gave up my job, and I've come here to do a master's, and I'm researching how we can effectively express te reo Māori using communication technology. So, I've spent the last year talking to Māori speech and language therapists who know and use AAC, these communication technologies, and who speak te reo Māori. I've also spoken with um, people who use these AAC communication systems to communicate, are really effective communicators in English, but who want to be able to talk in Māori, um, which is their language of belonging. And actually, these people know Māori in their heads, in their minds, they have language in Māori because they've grown up in Māori, but they're not able to communicate in Māori because we don't have the technology. So, I know what it is that they want. They want a voice that can speak te reo Māori, that can correctly pronounce it when they type it in their, on their devices. And they also want a device that will accurately represent Māori grammar and Māori vocabulary, rather than just being Māori words slapped on over the top of English language systems. So that's the information I have. That's the knowledge I have, thanks to the people who have shared it with me. The knowledge and information I don't have is how on earth you take that stuff which I know really well by now, after a year of thinking about it, and put it onto a technological system, which I know nothing about whatsoever. So I was telling Michael from Google, I don't know his last name, hello if you're here, about this, and he said, come and present at our conference, do a lightning talk, and I thought maybe that way I'll be able to find someone who knows about how technology works and who cares about communication access justice and can help me. So, if you might be that person, contact my supervisor. Don't know if you can see his email address here, and please do be in touch. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. So I've been told I need to be slightly clearer with my directions. When I, when I say your name, I'll, I'll point to which side of the stage you need to get set up on, so you can come down here, get set up, get mic'd up, all those things. Uh, up next on this side is Emma Sprinkmeyer, but first, Matthew Sherborne. <laughs> okay, my talk is about RSI. I don't know what it's called now. In the old days, I used to code a lot, and I got, you know, a pain here. I don't know if anyone else has got this sort of thing. And I was like, oh man, there's got to be something better. So. I got the keyboard, you know, the ergonomic keyboards and like stretches and all that and so on. Um, I'm going to tell you some of my keyboards and maybe you can Google them because I don't have the slides. First, I tried the Type Matrix, which is a grid keyboard, you know, where the, layer, the keys aren't staggered. They're in a, they're like this, they're, in, they're straight down. And you know, everyone, I don't know if anyone knows the story that originally they were staggered so that the typewriter mechanical could work, but then they just kept the old technology. Um, that went well for a while, and then it broke. And then there was the Ergodox, which is this one, which is an open source keyboard, uh, open source hardware and software. It has a teensy CPU thing in it, and LEDs, 
And the one, it comes with like aluminium legs, uh, but I didn't bring them because of the, the weight on the plane. Uh, and it comes with a beautiful gel thing. Um, I wanted to get it, but I have no idea how to build stuff like a lot of people here do. Then there was massdrop.com, I don't know if anyone knows about that, where lots of people say, oh, we want to get, you know, these, you have to buy the keys separately, the mechanical things, all the bits, and they will put everyone's order into one and then do it. And I missed out on two drops. They were like three months apart, so I didn't get it then. And in the end, I went to ergodoxeasy.com, which is not there, but... <laughs> so these guys, they're, they're making money by making open source hardware and software and then selling it like a product. And it cost me 500 bucks, but I think it's worth it. And I use it all the time, can't use it without it. Um, they have a way to configure your, you don't have to know how to program the Teensy, they have like a web, a web application and you map all the keys in there and I've got like five layers set up. And I use Programmer Dvorak does anyone know? Yeah, of course you know, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I programmed the water. So I changed from, okay, so when I had RSI, I was using QWERTY. I changed to Dvorak, and my RSI went down about 50%, like the pain. I changed to programmer Dvorak and decent keyboards, and I can program all day and never have any pain at all. And that's the end of my talk, and I think everyone should do it. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a laptop yet? <laughs> so the title of this next talk is called What Do I Do When It All Goes Wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, something's, wait. Doesn't look like it's the right laptop. It is? Oh, it is, wow. <laughs> I'll get there eventually. <laughs> um, on this side, we'll have uh, Carl Klitscher. So if you can uh, come down and get mic'd up. You ready to go? <laughs> There's a start button there somewhere, I swear. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> it's all the way over there. <laughs> yeah, no, there's not meant to be any ads at this thing, so like, if I, if I were to advertise something, I'd have to walk off stage, and we really can't have that. Um, <laughs> where's Keith? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Emma Sprinkmeyer. Okay, so that was clearly 100% intentional. Um, so, what do I do when it all goes wrong? Just some quick information about myself. The dog on the left is Rosie, the one on the right is Hugo. I have not met him yet. I cannot wait to. <laughs> um, this is my second time speaking. I don't think the crowd was this small last time, so uh, much easier. And of course, LCA volunteer. Um, so some potentially stressful situations featuring some of my original characters. Um, <laughs> the, the one that you see in every picture is Scadre, and they're just like, well, this is a, a kind of awkward situation. I don't want to be here. Kind of like last year's lightning talk. Another laptop problem. <laughs> so I walk up on stage. Everything seems to be fine until something isn't. And of course, like I was earlier, praying to the demo gods. And then the owner of the laptop arrived, and everything was fine. <laughs> And um, 
Preparing for this talk, I definitely felt quite stressed because, of course, laptop problems might happen again, like they did. <laughs> Gee, I wonder. <laughs> um, so there are various things that you can do. You can talk to friends, family, explain your feelings. There are various fiddling objects that you can mess around with as well to keep your hands occupied. And um, a really helpful breathing technique that I learned from a, prof from a professional is four seconds breathing in, four seconds holding, four seconds breathing out, four seconds holding, and to repeat. Thank you very much. Did Didn't you say in your email that you wouldn't need any extra time this year? I'll give you five minutes next year? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, Leon Wright, you're up on deck on this side. But first, Carl Klitscher. Please make him welcome. Okay, thanks, guys. Uh, I, too, have had a... Uh, Equipment fails, so we'll just leave it like that. Uh, my name is Carl Kutcher. I am the Secretary Treasurer of the New Zealand Open Source Society. Uh, and at this point, I'm supposed to say, we're not dead. Uh, <laughs> formed in 2003 um, with uh, you know, 15 uh, members as an incorporated society. So it's kind of like signing the US Declaration of Independence. It was really important in those days. Uh, we were registered as a charity in 2008. Uh, which basically means that any donation over $5 uh, can be tax deductible in New Zealand, if that's a financial incentive for you. Um, we managed to survive the ODF versus OOXML wars. Um, that was a very trying time, blood on the floor, you know, you, you, you name it. Uh, but one of the things that's happened over recent years is that there's been a, a slightly tailing off in, uh, in interest in the society as a whole. You know, the, the mailing lists are going down. People are still talking about things, but uh, it just seems to me that um, one of the issues is that uh, open source has now become so prevalent that we're just not really caring about it anymore or not really trying to maintain the momentum. So we've got public and private sector doing wonderful things in the, in the government. Uh, so we're trying to focus on the promotion and education about free and open source software in New Zealand. So it's the public-private sector keeping an eye on the government. Because we're a charity, we can't actually lobby government directly, but we are allowed to educate people. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, we can educate them to death or until they submit. Uh, <laughs> other areas are the uh, small, small to medium enterprise, which for New Zealand businesses is pretty much everyone. Uh, the small, small office, home office. Uh, and of course, we have the challenge of open versus FOPEN. Uh, and we've seen FOPEN source software a lot in the Internet of Things. So these are all areas that, uh, that we're trying to, uh, to, to progress. The main site is uh, very simple, nzoss.nz. Uh, so you can type that into your browser of choice and away you go. One thing I would ask is if you can, um, if you just sign up to the mailing list, if you've got a comment or some suggestion or an idea of where you want to go or you'd like the society to go, if you can sign up to the mailing list and send that through, that would be fantastic. We do offer services. There's a chat service, uh, Rocket Chat, uh, which we all know and love. Uh, we do supply a Git repository. So that's um, it's Git Labs, I think, isn't it, Dave? Yeah. Uh, so we can actually provide services to people in the country who don't otherwise have their own uh, you know, systems to, to, uh, uh, to support their, you know, whatever they're doing, their business. Uh, we've got instances of Mortic, Mastodon, Nextcloud, pretty much anything you want. Uh, and lastly, a big thanks to Catalyst Cloud for their continued support of the society. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carl. Thank you very much. OK, so on deck on this side, we have Talia White. But first, Leon Wright, who's going to be telling you about his badge. All right. So I'm Leon, and I love open hardware. You may have seen me around. You might have hugged me. And if you have Twitter, you've probably seen my bot. Yes, I hacked a hug detector into my badge. During LCA 2017, I was recovering from a series of life events that led to, um, left me with PTSD, which for me was mostly experienced 
as acute anxiety. Mix in a little uh, shyness, a dash of sensory overload, and I'd retreated to my room to sort of, you know, recharge. But what I really wanted to do was share my excitement for open hardware with everyone. And an idea popped into my head. So armed with an ESP8266, an infrared switch, and some Freetronics free pixels, Hug Detector version one was born. Whilst I was testing at 1 a.m. and on a pillow, because waking someone up for a hug seemed like a bad idea, <laughs> it became apparent that hugging becomes intimate extremely fast. Somewhere between 700 and 1,000 milliseconds, which is not a lot of time. So this badge was incredibly unreliable, but it generated interactions with an ease that I didn't even think was possible. Along with the energy and joy, I didn't expect at all. So after the success of version one, I decided hardware reliability needed to be addressed. So armed with a timer flight center, an ESP32, version two was built. It had an improved algorithm, and it proved to be so successful Twitter shadow banned my account. <laughs> so here we are at LCA 2019. I thought, how can I make this better? I know, over engineer it. <laughs> Behind this badge sits an ECS cluster, three Docker containers, <laughs> a proper domain, and Let's Encrypt certificates. The the algorithm also um, measures quality, displays it visually, and, um, and it also displays when it's broken, because that happens a lot. <laughs> and to avoid being shadow banned, hug quality descriptors are generated, and it even caters for hugs that couldn't be measured properly. In closing, I'd like to give a huge shout out to Opal as both my top code contributor and top hugger. Also, if socializing is a challenge for you, don't be afraid to find a way to express your brand because you'll find others just as excited in whatever it may be as you. And lastly, always make sure to get your worry and credit lest you at 1 a.m. let the smoke out of your just completed badge. <laughs> Beyond right. I'd, um, I'd offer a hug, but you're not wearing your badge at the moment. Um, Brenda Wallace, you're up uh, on this side. But first, Talia White. Hi, my name is Talia White, and, I'm, and for the record, I'm 14 years old. I've grown up in this community, and my very first Linux conf was Ballarat 2012, hence the shirt. I was only eight. I had been around people doing amazing things with technology throughout my life, and I always wanted to be able to do what they did. It, and I just dreamed that it would be me doing it. it but I, I, so, but then it just never really worked, and I just figured I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't able to learn things like coding. I didn't wake up knowing how to do it, so I figured I could never learn. And so I just never tried, and I held on to this idea for a long time. Then my best friend came into the picture, and she was writing the code for a robot for a school project. She asked me if I could help her, and I told her bits and pieces I'd picked up. After this, someone in our class showed us his Arduino kit for mechatronics. It seemed really cool, so I went home and tried to find a beginner's kit for Arduino, because I thought that maybe I could give it a try. After looking around, I found the same kit, which was the DF Robot Beginner's Arduino kit. A week or two later, it showed up, and the next day I got to work. I found a website that showed you the code you needed for each project and broke it down and what it all meant. I started with copying the code, verifying it, fixing what I needed, and running it. I would then change some things so it worked differently and try to teach myself how to code it all. I went from the super basics like a flashing LED to making this, an IR remote controlled number thingy. I have, to, I have to say, I was blown away by the fact that I made this. And in that day, I completed all the projects and finished off by seeing how many LEDs I could put on a breadboard. Hint, I ran out of LEDs before I ran out of room. This showed me that what I thought I could not do was actually possible. 
I want to tell everyone out there that if you are scared to try something because you don't think you're smart enough or you don't feel like you can get where you want to, to not give up. For years I thought that I could never do that and I am still learning. And I struggle with coding from nothing, but I'm still trying. So whether you or someone you know who wants to do something but thinks I'll never be smart enough or talented enough, get out there and give it a go or help them towards it. I hope that by hearing this, you will all try something new that you've wanted to do for ages. Thank you. Thanks, Talia. Thank you. I've only got one screen anyway. Uh, so up on deck on this side we have uh, Paul. But first, Brenda. Hi, I'm Brenda. I work for the New Zealand government. It takes me about three minutes to explain what I do, so this is ideal. Um, <laughs> There are many rules that are inflicted on all of us in our lives. Some of them are called legislation, regulation, things your mum says to do, but I focus on the legislation. Legislation is written by parliamentarians, and in this country they claim to write it in English. You know, um, anyone here had to implement in software a rule that came eventually from law? Yeah, something as easy as GST, ACC, working for families, I'm unemployed. What, what kind of money help can I get? They're all in law and they're numbers. And these subsets of law turn out to be sometimes ambiguous and sometimes not. What, um, because this happens over and over, you have to implement the Holidays Act, work out how much holidays you have to get. You also do. You come up with a different number than you. So the people who use software package A get this much holidays, people who get the software package B get this much holidays, times 100, and then you find out 30 years later you've been paying everybody wrong. True story. <laughs> so what we've done in my team, and I'm going to speed up my talking, is we've decided to work with the Parliamentary Council's office in New Zealand, and this is a bit of a pilot and it's a bit unofficial, but let's just say it. Um, we're going to uh, publish, for some of the legislation, a parallel publishing in Python. Stop, she only has 80, 80 I, seconds. Don't use my time. Okay. Um, so it's sitting there, it's sitting on a website that you're all going to hit and break. It's called rules.nz. I'll get a gov domain later. Um, and we have started to implement um, a lot of what we call unambiguous rules that usually result in a number, such as how much money you'll get if you support an orphan child. So people in situations like the, can I raise my grandkid? bad things have happened, can work out in advance whether they can do it or not. We have unit tests. This blew their mind. They'd never had these before. <laughs> I said, for a solo mother with, um, who is raising three orphaned children as well as their own, this is what they get. If they are this, this is what they get. If you make this um, pull request and you change the legislation, this is the regression. Did that, is that what you meant? So we have it all there. We have it in the open. We have it open sourced. You can send me a pull request. I'll, I'll have to check your references. But next time government comes up with a number and says your number is 42, you can say show you're working and I'll point you at GitHub. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. That's, that's really cool. Uh, on this side we have E. Dunham, but first, Paul Gardner-Steven. Good afternoon, folks. It was super. The kids have gone. I wanted the first group of kids that came out and were thinking about how do we solve disaster problems and save lives. It's something which is very close to my heart. Those who know me for a long time will know that we do work on the Serval project. Um, this graph I invented. Um, on the left we have GDP per kilometre of coastline. This sounds very strange. And then we have the length of coast to land ratio, basically numbers on the left, the bigger they are, the better, or the smaller they are, the worse. And on the right-hand side, you want the number to be small. Notice all these Pacific islands have got horrible numbers in both columns. Everywhere else has like numbers that are a gazillion times better. What this means, it is thinking hard to get something like a tsunami early warning system that can work in these countries and be affordable. The normal approach to doing this costs hundreds of thousands of dollars per 10 to 20 kilometers. So it is more than the GDP of these countries allocated to that length of coastline. This is impossible to sustain. 
This is what we're trying to do. Get rid of these huge North Korea style things, replace them with something like that in a shoebox full of electronics. And add a satellite phone on a giant satellite based PABX. We know we can do all of this stuff. We want to do it. The Pacific Islands want it. I need help to make this a reality. And if we think back to what happened in Indonesia at the end of last year, uh, with the tsunamis that were generated there, something like 1,500 of those lost lives was directly because they did not hear about the tsunami coming that the government knew was coming but had no way to get that news out to people because the mobile phone network had failed because of the earthquake. We need to have these redundant systems. We need to protect that whole Indo-Pacific coastline. It is within our grasp, but I cannot do it alone. Please come see me, grab me online, however you wish, if you want to be part of this uh, to try and make an impact. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Over on this side, we have a Sherelle. But first, E. Dunham. Hi there. This is the 53rd conference talk I've given in the past five years. If you think that you can't do just one conference talk, I'm here to tell you that you are wrong. First, <laughs> why would anybody give a conference talk? You personally benefit from speaking because you get to make new friends, it builds your portfolio, and it lets you tell people about the changes that you want to see in the tech community. Your company or project benefits because it's um, because they get to see um, their, because your talk makes them look good and the, your, their name on your badge is free advertising. And the conference benefits because the more papers the speakers committee has to choose from, the better a program they're able to build. So if you want all that, here's how to do it. So first off, what should you say and where you, should you say it are actually the same question because the best talk for you personally to give is at the intersection of what you know, what the conference needs, and what the audience wants to hear about. You might have heard about how the easiest trick to getting a best-selling book online is to publish it in the intersection of two categories with very little overlap. Talks can be the same way. If you're in two disciplines that you're just average at, you can be the best in the world at their intersection if there's hardly anybody else doing it. <laughs> so, you've got some topic ideas. Next, find some conferences that you want to attend from their dates, their locations, their themes, and the way they run their communities. Then, write a talk abstract that gives some context to your idea and asks the questions that your talk will answer. Um, so, submit it a lot and get rejected a lot. Keep those rejections with pride, because every one of them represents a time that you dodged a bullet. Each rejection <laughs> is a time that a committee helped you avoid ending up in front of an empty room or a room full of people who didn't care about what you have to say. So, keep applying and then eventually you get accepted and then you get to actually write the talk. There's a bunch of do's and don'ts about telling your talk story and they're all well documented online. It's really important to practice, record yourself, listen to the recording even though it sounds terrible because we all sound terrible to ourselves. So then you get to the conference and you give that talk just like you practiced. And then at the end, somebody asks a question that you don't know the answer to because you're smart enough to pull that talk off but still dumb enough to try. And this is terrifying because you think that they'll find out just how little you know and you just want to crawl away back to your room and check the docs for the answer. But that is your answer. You tell them where you would look to find that fact that, you asked, that they asked for and that solves their problem of not knowing by telling them where to find it. So everybody who had the same questions that your abstract asked has learned the answers from your talk because you delivered on its promises and you've succeeded and then everybody applauds you. <laughs> I, uh, I promise. I promise. Emily had some slides there. Uh, I'm sorry if you didn't see them. Um, Wait, were they not? No, it didn't change. <laughs> the other thing you should do is test your laptop. Mm. Anyway, uh, up on this side we have uh, Jen, but first Sherelle. All right. Hello. So my name is Sherelle. I'm a security analyst at Ausset, and I'm here to talk about CVE 2019-3462. So um, just quickly, um, a CVE is a number that we use to identify vulnerabilities. So this one um, was announced the other day. 
into vulnerability and apt, which is the packaging tool used in Debian, um, Ubuntu, Mint, et cetera. Um, so if you haven't like seen the, I guess, kept up with the news this week or anything, um, the TLDR is a malicious person can um, add a false hash into the header so uh, you don't suspect a thing and they can execute arbitrary code as root on your computer, which is awesome. Um, not uh, So the wonderful maintainers, oh, Hi, thanks. Um, the wonderful maintainers have already patched this. Um, and if you do get it, uh, then because it's in app, just disable redirects um, when you do. And for more info, you can check the advisories um, and, or the original blog post. But uh, this talk, what this talk is actually about, um, the reasons why we use HTTPS. Um, and the two reasons I want to bring up is um, the obvious one, encryption, um, because if you're sending data to your bank, you don't want people to see that, obviously. Um, but this doesn't seem that useful for apps because we know the size, we know the content, meh. But the other reason is um, attestation. And because um, you want to know that the content is trustworthy. Uh, so this will help prevent these man in the middle of attacks. Um, and if you want to, you can enable this by installing app transport HTTPS. So stay safe, stay patched, and have a great weekend. Thank you. <laughs>
So the Arduino and uh, the Beagle Wayne Black represent two excellent examples of the open hardware, open software uh, ecosystem that we're, able to, we're all able to be a part of now and enjoy. But it's fair to say their design point was never to be super high performance things. They're, they're embedded devices primarily, and that's, that's great for that particular, particular application. Another trick question. How many of you got one of these, a desktop computer at home, or do you use regularly running Linux? More than that, surely. How many of you run this operating system? Right, yeah, okay, that's kind of awkward, right? So a little more seriously, what, what, what do we mean? What, what sort of design points, what sorts of things would we seek to have in a truly open and high performance computer system? We would want an open hardware design. We'd want an open software stack. We'd want no binary blobs on that system. We don't want any unexpected operating systems included that we didn't <laughs> entirely expect. And ideally we want no cost and performance penalty as well. It should cost the same as what the contemporary systems do on the market. Now how many of you remember this? Okay, right, so <laughs> joking aside, it's fair to say that what we're doing at OpenPower, at least a part of what we do at OpenPower is an evolution of the original PowerPC processor architecture and everything that comes with that. So I go back to my original premise of all the sorts of things that we want in an open and high performance computer system. My view is that our members in the, the foundation produce any number of the examples of this. Uh, hyperscale nodes that sit in data centers down to little micro ATX motherboards that cost the same as just about any other desktop PC out there. We'd really love to have you as part of our project. Check out what our members are doing and thank you for your attention today. Thanks, you. Okay, uh, Stephen Sykes, you're up on deck. <laughs> but first, Ben O'Rice. Hello. So, COBOL. What is COBOL? Stop. COBOL was a language designed in 1959 based on work by Grace Hopper. You should look her up, she's awesome. Um, it was standardized in 1968. It's been continually developed since then. The latest uh, standard was issued in 2014. Widely used in business, but not so much these days and very much not in academia. Um, it looks a bit like that for a hello world, including all the job control language that you need to get it running on a mainframe. Um, it's not used for a lot of things anymore. The world kind of moved on, but a fun game among some people is to say, well, what language is the new COBOL? What's the new one that's gonna be slying around in this sort of maintenance graveyard for a long time? You know, what, what is going to be the new COBOL? I mean, maybe it's a language that, you know, is similarly looked down on by a large number of people, but it has a large installed base of code and it's constantly causing people lots of problems. Yes, maybe PHP is the new COBOL. <laughs> but, but, but wait, but maybe it's a language that was used really widely a while ago, but isn't so much now. It was really influential in its time and it's still being developed today despite a low user base, so maybe Perl is the new COBOL. <laughs> but, what about a language that's determinedly still in use despite the fact that everyone's telling you to stop? Maybe Python 2 is the new COBOL. <laughs> or maybe it's a language that's hugely influential in web applications. It's got a long and storied history of bizarre incompatibilities and weirdness. Yes, JavaScript <laughs> is the new, no, wait. But maybe it's one of the most longest lived languages that's still in active use with a glorious history of allowing oversights and development to lead to hilariously expensive bugs. C is the new COBOL. But, Maybe this whole ragging on COBOL is just yet another form of contempt. I mean, beyond that, I mean, it's a, it's a language from effectively a bygone era. People tended not to care about the COBOL code bases they have, and that could lead to a whole lot of fun. Y2K happened because COBOL let you specify numbers based on how many digits they had. And so you could say this year only has two digits in it and that turned into a bit of a problem when you suddenly realized they needed more than that. But that led to a couple of really good years for people who actually knew how to maintain COBOL. <laughs> there were a lot, of, a lot of banks and other similar institutions going, oh God, we need help now. Maybe the real COBOL is the maintenance debt we incurred along the way. <laughs> But it's not just things like COBOL that have that problem. Heartbleed was a fantastic bug for people who weren't hit by it. 
Um, <laughs> And it resulted from the fact that OpenSSL, being a hugely important piece of software for a whole lot of things, was effectively unmaintained. And a whole bunch of people saw Heartbleed and immediately started to try and fix it. And a lot of the response to that was, what the hell took you so long? There's a big problem brewing in various corners of open source where corporations in their endless pursuit of things they don't have to pay for are making enormous use of open source software and not kicking anything back to the people who keep that software up to date. If I had to sum that up to people who hold the purse strings, I would say if you are existentially dependent on a piece of third party code, including its potential lack of maintenance in your risk profile, support the maintainers. Thanks, Bano. Bano. Okay, that was the last of our lightning talks. Uh, I would like to thank all of our 14 lightning talk presenters. Also, our wonderful AV team who keep me on stage for a minimum of time during these sorts of things. So thanks to the presenters, thanks to the AV team.